As a citizen of this great country, do you play a role in helping to keep it great? Are you registered to vote? Do you get out to vote? How do you know who to vote for? Do you know what legislation is being proposed that can negatively impact you? Grab your pen and paper. We're about to have a civics lesson and a call to action. What do you like best about living here? Is it the natural beauty? The great neighborhoods? All the choices for recreation and entertainment? Do you have a job you like? Enjoy the mix of generations. How about walking to the park and local restaurants? There's a lot to like about living here, and it all begins with good community planning. It brings value to everyone in the community. Learn more at planning.org. That's planning.org, a message from the American Planning Association. Hello and welcome to the Clarion Call Show. I am Janice Hatcher Liggins, your host. The United States is governed by a system of laws and regulations. Many of these laws protect, sustain, and support its citizen. However, there are laws that have a very negative impact on the citizen. And these laws, good and bad, are passed by people we voted for. What is your role in ensuring positive legislation? How can you make a difference? Joining us for a quick civics lesson on how to engage in the legislative process is Maryland House of Delegates Eric Barron, delegate from District 24. Delegate Barron served as state and federal prosecutor and counsel and a policy advisor to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. Delegate Barron is now a defense attorney with a keen focus on criminal justice reform. Delegate Barron, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I am delighted to talk with you as a legislator because I want everybody to know more about the legislative process. What What is their role? Right. And what kind of, of uh, measures have been taken and are underway? So right. I want you to share because you've been busy. <laughs> yes. So give us a brief overview of your background. You are currently a defense attorney. Sure. I, I'm an attorney in private practice. We have a citizen legislature, which means uh, most of us have uh, a private life and a day job in addition to representing citizens in Annapolis in the Maryland General Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm an attorney in private practice at the law firm of Whiteford, Taylor & Preston, which is a business law firm. And, uh, um, you know, during the interim, I'm in, in full practice at the firm representing uh, businesses and individuals in civil and criminal litigation. Okay. Did I see somewhere that you also do something about um, international relations, criminal, criminal practices internationally? Or sure. Sometimes my practice takes me certainly throughout Maryland and in other states, but every once in a while there's, a, there's an international aspect to my practice. Well, it just depends on the client and what the client's needs are. Well, wonderful. So as a delegate, um, many people don't understand what the role of the delegate is. Right. So can you share what do you do? What does the delegate do? And, and how does the community interact with you? Sure. So most people are familiar with Congress. Right. And, and Congress is the legislative branch of government for uh, the federal level. Well, I'm a state representative on the state level, so in, in the, uh, for the Maryland legislature. And uh, at the state level, we also have a, it's a bi, uh, bicameral uh, uh, legislative branch. So we have a Senate and we have a House of Delegates. I'm one of your delegates okay. representing Prince George's County. Wonderful, wonderful. And you've been very busy. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so tell us a little bit. I know there are a couple of key initiatives that you've worked on, and that's um, Metro, 
right. as well as the county hospital. Right. So what what's going on with those? So when I was uh, first elected in 2014, the Prince George's Re Regional Medical Center was still somewhat of a question mark. Uh, since that time, uh, we have uh, been able to fight for full funding for a new regional medical center, which mm. should break ground uh, uh, a, a year or two from now. Uh, that will be in Largo. Um, and we have, in addition to full funding, we have increased funding by $100,000. So $10,000 annually extra on top of what was already agreed to mm. for the medical center. So okay. health care is, is coming to Prince George's. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Mm. We need it, we need it. I understand that the Prince George's Hospital Center is one of the primary um, facilities for cardiac. Yes. And so you know, we need we need cardiac and we need uh, you know primary facilities specialties. Right. And a number of other facilities. So right. wonderful. We're in Largo. Uh, so right next to the uh, the uh, metro station in Largo, in Largo Town Center. Okay. Um, and and uh, very excited about it coming. It should also be not only a boost for health care in the county and reducing health disparities, but also increasing economic development around right. that metro uh, station, increasing commercial, our commercial tax base as a county. And I know that you know using that uh, the, the metro sites as economic development is another one of your areas, so that ties right in together. So you've been very busy also in criminal justice. Yes. Uh, reform. Yes. We recently had a show um, about the money bail crisis, mm. and I don't usually like to talk about topics back-to-back -back shows, but I was very, very moved with learning myself about the money bail crisis. Um, tell us what there was a young lady on who had actually been incarcerated and her children were taken from her and so forth. Mm -hmm. Tell us what is the challenge with the money bill. So bail reform is about uh, uh, whether or not someone should be held in jail uh, pre-trial, before they've been uh, adjudicated or, or uh, had a trial and been found guilty, should they be held? And the two aspects of that are, are you either a flight risk or you're a danger to the community? Um, and if you're not uh, either of, of those things, then uh, we should save taxpayer money and not incarcerate somebody, but allow them to be out at school, taking care of their family, and working, especially if we're talking about a nonviolent offender, a nonviolent offense. Uh, what we've had, unfortunately, is a default to money bail uh, to uh, making someone put up money for their freedom. And what that has uh, caused is people who don't have the resources and so they end up being incarcerated simply because they don't have any money. Just because they're poor. Just right. because they're poor. And conversely, s people who are dangerous or who may be a, 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 a threat to uh, the community are able to purchase their freedom. Mm. So it's a it's a safety issue. It's it's a it's a fairness issue it's as well. Fair. And constitutionally, even yes, yes. And so a year ago, I was part of a group uh, of uh, my colleagues around the state who requested a legal opinion on the constitutionality of our bail practices in Maryland. We asked the Attorney General for an opinion on its constitutionality. He came out with an opinion that said it's, it's likely not constitutional. So what this spurred is a change by the court system on our bail practices to ensure that a judge is making an individualized determination of the person in front of them and whether or not they have the resources for bail or there are other conditions that we can place them on pending trial that will allow them to be doing the things that they're supposed to be doing until it's determined uh, that they are or are not guilty of a crime. Mm -hmm. Because the whole idea of the bail is to make sure that they it's a deposit just to make sure that they return and show up for trial. Is, is that one of the major right. parts of it? Right, and, and uh, there's plenty of studies that have shown that you don't necessarily need someone to put up money to ensure that they will return to court uh, uh, at their next hearing date. Also, 
just because someone's putting up money does not mean that they're not going to do something wrong. Mm -hmm. So a default to bail really is putting our, our justice system in a position where it's not only uh, unfair, but it's not particularly safe mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. So what these new uh, court rules will do, will do, which they've been, uh, just came into effect in July, will have a judge look at the person, determine whether or not you are a flight risk or a danger to community, and then determine what kind of conditions, if any, if, if release is appropriate, that you should be placed on. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, you said it came in effect in July, so going forward, that's gonna be the way it works. Right. What about the people who are already sitting in jail, who don't have money to pay? Um, is there a way for them to be able to also get out? So there's, there's a process by which if, if you are uh, incarcerated pre-trial uh, and it's because you simply can't make bail, you can petition to the court for a, uh, another hearing. And what the court should do under these new practices is determine, well, well what is an amount that you can uh, pay or if bail is, or maybe not bail isn't even appropriate for mm -hmm. you maybe we just need you to report uh, monthly or periodically uh, pending trial maybe we just want to make sh sure someone's keeping tabs on you to make sure that you're employed that you're going to school and coming home at a, a reasonable hour and doing the things <coughs> that you're supposed to do as a good citizen yeah because frankly um, even with reporting um, periodically, if they've not been charged, if they've not been convicted, right? Why even do that? And well, so, really, they're not guilty of anything. It, it's a good question. And so, you know, when you have a system that is so dependent on bail that uh, we're basically punishing people who are innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be really careful what kind of conditions we impose on people. And that's whether it's bail, whether it's uh, certain reporting requirements. Um, some of those things may be appropriate depending on the individual. And so what these new rules are asking the court to do is make a individualized assessment of the person that's in front of you right here and now and not jump to any conclusions mm -hmm. that may disproportionately affect people of color. Mm -hmm. Because they do. They, they alarmingly, <clears throat> they do with um, um, large, <clears throat> excuse me, large amounts of, most of the people who are impacted by the money bill uh, crisis, I think, are people of color, like 87%. And mm -hmm. so, um, that's great, but that, so that's already in effect. That's already in effect, um, but there, there's certainly more work to be done. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that the courts are uh, uh, applying the rule appropriately, and uh, what we need to do is make sure that there's pretrial services throughout the state mm. so that judges feel more comfortable letting someone out pending trial because they would know that there's a, a, a function there that will keep tabs on the individual, mm -hmm. and some people need help. And it may be appropriate that the judge imposes a condition that uh, that the person go to treat, uh, drug or alcohol treatment right, or something right, of right. that nature. And so the judge wants to be comfortable that the person is doing what they're supposed to be doing, and a pretrial services function can make sure that that happens. Right. right. The young lady who was on our show last time uh, was bailed out um, by this mm. organization that was on Mother's Day bailing out a lot of women across the country and um, in the process she was she was locked up because she took her children with her to a probation mm. um, um, meeting and she wasn't supposed to take her children and so um, they took her children put her in jail and took her children mm -hmm. and so she was bailed out by this um, Mother's Day bailout but her children are still in the system right and she's having to fight to try to get them back which is money and and so forth so I think there's so many different facets Ab absolutely so you know I don't, I'm not familiar with that particular situation mm -hmm. but we based on the information that you just relayed we have to ask ourselves is this really necessary and is this what 
we want as a society right. and 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 basically is this what we want our taxpayer dollars spending exactly on? exactly well thanks hold on tight we'll be back so how do we ensure legislation is passed that helps the community and not hurt that's next stay tuned How far would you go to help someone? Would you go to the end of your driveway? Would you cross a street? Would you cross an ocean? To a place 6,000 miles from home? How long would you go? Would you go for a week, a month, a year? Would you go for two years? Would you go if you could use your knowledge to teach someone and in the process, maybe learn something yourself? Life is calling. How far will you go? Peace Corps. Welcome back. Our country is run by rules and laws. So before a rule is made, shouldn't we know about its potential benefits or negative impacts? Has your voice ever been heard before a rule was passed? Joining us again to help us better understand how legislation is made is Delegate Eric Barron, Maryland District 24. Again, Delegate Barron, I'm, I'm excited about all of this because it's an education for me and, and hopefully f even for a lot of other viewers. Right. So I want to now talk about the mandatory minimums. There have been a lot of people put in jail for various drug-related crimes, for example, right. uh, and with mandatory minimums. And I know that you've done some work recently around that, successfully so. So tell us what is the problem with it and what's been done. So mandatory minimums is, is basically a, a sentencing policy that says if you're found guilty of a particular offense, then you should automatically do a minimum of, a, of X number of years. And uh, a big problem with that is that you don't have a judge who can determine whether, uh, you know, if it's a mandatory 10, whether that's actually appropriate for you versus another individual. It really hand, hand strings the, uh, the judge's mm -hmm. discretion mm -hmm. on making appropriate determination of what the, what the right punishment should be for someone who may be a, a violent drug offender versus someone who has a, 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 a habitual problem. Mm -hmm. And so there was legislation that was passed and, and hard fought, from what I hear, um, to try to include that, uh, getting rid of the minimums. Right. Tell us about that. What happened? So uh, uh, two years ago, we, the General Assembly passed the Justice Reinvestment Act. Uh, much of the sentencing portions of that bill come effect this October. And what we did uh, is eliminate most of the mandatory minimums for drug offenses on the, the theory that, one, we want a judge to make, be able to make an appropriate determination and not uh, uh, a cookie cutter approach to sentencing and determine whether you know, someone who may have a drug habit and may be dealing to feed their own drug habit deserves perhaps a lesser sentence than someone who is a, you know, a, a drug runner and doesn't have a habit and mm -hmm. is just doing wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Justice Reinvestment Act uh, said that, you know, we, we want to take more of a health-centered approach 
to uh, the justice system and not, uh, uh, yeah, not looking at, at those two things in a vacuum, criminal justice over here and health care over here. Mm -hmm. No, they're intertwined. And so that's what the justice reinvestment is about, uh, from sentencing through reentry, uh, reorienting our policies to uh, reflect what our priorities are and should be. So now, um, if should someone um, be charged with a drug-related crime, um, the policy starts October, right. where the minimums are gone. Right. Okay. But what about people who are already in prison? So what we were able to do is enact a provision that would allow people who were sentenced under the old regime to appeal or petition a judge to change their sentence under the new regime. And under the new regime, that the, the prosecutor's office would have to show that uh, it's in the interest of justice for their old sentence to remain. Um, so those individuals, starting in October, will have a limited opportunity, uh, about a year, to uh, petition the court uh, to change their sentence. Now, let me ask you this, and this uh, may be an unusual kind of a question, but if that person has an opportunity to get out of jail or prison based on this new law, why, what benefit is it to the prosecutor? And you've been a prosecutor and a, def and a defense attorney. Yes. So what benefit is it to the prosecutor to try to keep that person in jail anyway? Well, you know, w what, what we're trying to encourage is an individualized uh, assessment by a judge and by an a our adversarial system that we have, a defense attorney on the one side and a prosecutor's office on the other side. And it may be the case that in some circumstances the government or prosecutor may say, you know what, this is an individual who uh, hasn't been doing what they're supposed to be doing behind the walls while they've been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. This is an individual who, uh, you know, there may be some circumstances surrounding his particular case uh, that indicates he should remain incarcerated uh, longer than someone who may have been, may, again, we're trying to distinguish between drug users mm -hmm. and those who are really abusing our system and, and poisoning people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So that limited window of time that those who were already under the old regime, as you say, that's only a year. Right. So I know I want to help make sure. <laughs> right. I want to make sure I help that um, ensure they know uh, about that information. And so <clears throat> when you are looking at, and understand that in, you just got rid of um, legislation that imposes mandatory minimums for drug-related crimes. Right. But there's another move now um, out of Baltimore to try to implement mandatory minimums for guns, right. for gun possession. And I know that you say we should not have mandatory minimums at all. Tell, what's going on with that? Well, in, in, in Baltimore, unfortunately, they're, they're really dealing with a significant crime rate. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the community and public officials are looking for ways to respond to that and to, to help you know, mitigate uh, that crime rate and that, that spiking homicide rate. And so one of the ideas is to uh, enact more uh, mandatory minimums on uh, gun offenses. Um, you know, one has to wonder if we're we're worried about violent crime and homicide, and people are you know using guns for that. Um, what if they're not deterred by the potential of punishment for a violent crime or homicide? Already, they're, <laughs> right? They're certainly not going to be deterred by uh, a mandatory minimum for a gun possession. So I. I I would prefer a more comprehensive look at violent crime reduction and crime reduction period. And that may mean uh, additional enforcement tools and, and reorienting our, our, the way we uh, police. Um, but also it probably means 
doing things that kind of get behind the socioeconomic factors of, of crime and why people commit crime. Um, and also one of the biggest challenges we have in the criminal justice system is that trust deficit between certain communities mm. and law enforcement. I think we'll find that the more we work on building public trust between the community and law enforcement, the more we will see crime reduce. Mm. Uh, law enforcement needs to respect the community. The community needs to respect law enforcement. What, we'll, what prosecutors will see is they'll have uh, citizens and jurors who will be more likely to lend credibility to a police officer mm -hmm. and, and, and believe uh, uh, a police officer when he says something happened in the community. Uh, and uh, law enforcement will also see that witnesses will be f more forthcoming mm -hmm. and want to cooperate. Mm -hmm that benefits public safety. Mm -hmm. um, and the community needs to understand that, you know, not all police officers are bad. You know, um, most want to help. And so the more we come together in a partnership, the more we'll see crime drop. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And speaking of partnerships, um, even in the whole legislative process, the whole um, passing of laws and regulations, and voting, the community has a relationship and has a responsibility in that partnership. Right. When you talk about passing laws, what is it that you see the community is doing that it needs to stop doing? And what kind of things do you think they need to start doing? Well, um, in so many words, uh, the, the community and your average citizen needs to pay more attention. Mm. Be an informed citizen. Uh, read, look up the, the, the individuals who represent you, know what they stand for, but also know what you expect of them, what mm -hmm. you want them to stand mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we turn representative democracy on its head. Um, I am supposed to take my marching orders from you and the people, uh, not the other way around. Mm. So, you know, the, the best way that I can do that myself is to, you know, disseminate information, touch as many people as I can, hear from as many people as I can, but also uh, constituents and citizens need to be engaged. Show up at your PTA meeting, your HOA meeting, the town hall, call your representative, mm -hmm. email them, mm -hmm. uh, be an active participant in our democracy. That's what they can do. Well, and I think a lot of that goes with um, on voting the day of the vote is not the day you find out who the candidates' names are. Right. You know, study ahead of time and look. And, you know, we all go to the polls and there are folk at the polls and they're handing out their little leaflets, but you should already know. Right. Not just who you're going to vote for, but what's their record? What is What have they done or not done? Right, that's and, absolutely right. Yeah, I think that's that educating the, the, the community, getting itself educated mm -hmm. on particular candidates in advance is key. And then once we do vote, um, check them out. What have they done? Hold them accountable for what they said they were going to do. Absolutely. And it, it's only with all of that happening simultaneously, because even if we work out the relationship between the police and the community, if we don't vote for people who are going to be productive in what they say to, commu to help the community, um, we we're not going to make but so much progress. So I love that, and I appreciate We're going to have to end it there. I may have to have you back to go I'd in a little bit more. I'd love to come back. Thanks so much for having <laughs> me. It's been great. I really great. appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. It's been great. So we all have a role and obligation to participate in the legislative process. Your vote is your voice, but only when you cast your vote, your vote with knowledge and purpose. The Clarion Call has two major voter registration drives coming up, so please call, email, or check out our Facebook page for information. Together we can make our voices heard and get policies that are good for the people. That's it for now, and we hope you enjoy the show. Join us next time, won't you, for the Clarion Call. Until then, I'm Janice Liggins. Blessings to you.